Good evening, everybody. Welcome back for another edition of Reasonable Doubt, brought to you by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. As you will see, our background is not with us tonight. We are on the curtains. And as always with me is my co-host, Julio Vela. What's going on, my friend? As Steven Tyler says, back in the saddle again. How'd you enjoy that uh, <laughs> horns game last week? The horns, I, 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 enjoy, I loved it, and I cannot wait to see <sighs> the horn frogs get smashed. That's right, this weekend. That's what we're counting on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be here for the next hour talking with our guests this evening. First of all, she's back. She came back for another week. She, she was inspired so much by hosting that she was acted like a guest last week. <laughs> well, so she decided to come back. As, a, feral. as a, a halfway guest this time. Yeah, so, so this time we, we're actually putting you in the guest, in the guest seat, not the co-host seat. <laughs> so I'm free to so talk even, as much as I want this that's time? That's right. Perfect. And I'm free to interrupt you and, and not let you finish your thoughts. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> and our guest of honor this evening, ladies and gentlemen, the lovely, the talented, Mark Bennett. Hi there, Jimmy. Otherwise known as, what would our producer call him? Ooh. Law God? Do that we have a tag yet? I don't know if he has a tag. <laughs> Is it up? Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Good. To quote Steven Tyler, I don't want to miss a thing. <laughs> That's awesome. It's amazing. He's still around, isn't it? Wow. I mean, wow. Still, really good for and you. still singing at high no. notes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's what's amazing. Uh, like I said, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be here for the next hour talking with you. Phone number 713-807-1794 if you want to get in on the conversation. We'll also have Twitter up. You can shoot me a comment, a question at HCCLA underscore TV, and we'll take them right here live on the air from Mark, Katie, and Julio and myself. We'll, we'll also chime in our opinions. We don't Every now and then. Stick to Every it. now and then. I just like to ask the questions. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's start with the thing that's on everybody's mind this week, and that'd be the Kavanaugh hearings, because uh, it's, it's really taken a, uh, a turn here. <laughs> first, first, we have the... The Democrats protesting the, the hearings going forward. We have that whole mess on the first three days. And now we have an allegation uh, of a woman who went to high school with Judge Kavanaugh, who claims that 36 years ago at a party in Washington, D.C., she was sexually assaulted by him. Um, they, want, they have delayed the hearing, I think, until Monday. Uh, she, they have offered her, Grasley has offered either a public hearing, a private hearing. They've offered to fly to California to talk to her. So far, all of those have been proven to be unacceptable for her. She has asked for an FBI investigation before she will talk to the committee. Um, and I'm gonna throw out another thing that just came out today. Uh, Ed Whalen, who is a very, um, you know, he's, he's considered a pretty, pretty decent source on things, has outlined a, a very, um, how should we say this? compelling uh, argument that maybe this is a case of mistaken identity and that we maybe shouldn't doubt the fact that she was sexually assaulted, but there might actually be someone who looked like Judge Kavanaugh and was referred to as kind of his look-alike twin in high school. Um, Whalen's, actually... Whalen's statement is very persuasive. Yes. Right? He's, <laughs> you're, he's... Not, you're not selling books here tonight. I am right? not selling books, oh. but, but... Uh, in fact, it's not your book. <laughs> it's not. I give the book back. Um, so I put he... this all out here for, for just so the audience knows kind of what's going on and catch you up, but I'd, I'd like us all to kind of generally talk about everything. Um, and, you know, Mark, start us off. What are your general yeah. thoughts about where we're going? What does Whalen say? What is, what, what's so Whalen so say? he has a theory of, of mistaken identity. He says that uh, he starts off with the location of the party. He says that the party happened near a particular country club. He maps out the <coughs> homes of the other people who we, who we believe to be at the party. Nobody, including Kavanaugh, lived near the country club. He finds this other person who was at the school who looked a lot like Kavanaugh. He, did. he has the, the yearbook pictures of the two guys who looked a lot alike then and look a lot alike now. He even has um, the layouts of the house. He has the, he has <laughs> the floor plans of the house that fit with the girl's description of how, the, the now woman's <laughs> description of how things happened. Um, and he, his, 
the theory that he's presenting is that she it was a case of mistaken identity, whether mistaken identity then, mistaken identity in you know, 2012, mistaken yeah. identity now. And yeah, it's, I, it's persuasive. It's people hear the story and if they hadn't already made up their minds, they're going to look at this and say, wow, that's that's a pretty compelling argument. Well, she's not just some uh, Joe girl on the street, though. No, she's a she's highly educated. Um, she has uh, university you know, professor, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But this also goes back to how unreliable the eyewitness is in general. And now you're going back 33 years, and, 36. or 30, 36 years, and saying... See? Yeah. Even she got yeah. it wrong. And saying this is the person it was. And we know even a, in, you know, as defense attorneys, we know how unreliable an eyewitness statement is. Right. So, and, and you throw alcohol into the mix and, and youth and you know, who knows what really happened there. Uh, I don't see any way that in the face of that defense, a jury could be convinced. Right. But of course, we're not dealing with a jury. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I wanted to ask about that, because obviously in the in the context of a criminal case, you know, uh, the, the eyewitness testimony and mistake of identity or mistake of fact, obviously we talked about mistake of fact last week, um, you know, all that comes into play in the reliability and whether the state can prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. And and certainly this this side by side lineup of the two of them, both in high school and today, where they where they still look almost alike. Um, it would be pretty compelling from a reasonable doubt standpoint that if you're a prosecutor, you might not be able to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt, but we're not there. We're, we're in a confirmation hearing for a Supreme Court justice where not only do the rules of evidence not apply, but there's no standard of proof. So you're representing, imagine you're representing the other guy, right? And Senator Grassley calls you up and says, I'm inviting you to come talk to us. Would you come talk to us about this theory? What do you do? Say no. <laughs> <laughs> say right? no. Right? Say hell no. Yeah, <laughs> Not just no, but no. hell no, right? Yeah, what the guys, there's no possible motivation for the guy to come in and... and well, unless he didn't himself. do it, though. Even unless then, he didn't do it. What if he then, did not do this? Even, and no, assuming can you imagine that he, if it's assuming a he, crazy frame job? Assuming he didn't do it, what benefit is there possibly to him to, to going into the, the Senate Judiciary Committee and defending himself? Why? Why? You're his lawyer. Why would you put him on the record for anything? To, because I did not sexually assault this woman. I, I just Screw would, that. I would tell him not to even participate. Well, I would too. I mean, I, I think that's yeah. a smart thing to I do. Would, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't play that game. But what if he? What if he's a professional? What if he has a family? What if he is, uh, you know, it, it has his own aspirations? And this dude who looks like him and his cohorts are putting him on a frame job. Is it? Isn't that an? I mean, to come and to come and say you're like, look, no, sorry, everyone, I might have looked like him, but that wasn't me. So when, when you respond to their allegations, you give the allegations mm. weight, right? Sure. If you don't have to respond and you, you get up and you deny it, then people are saying, okay, you know, shift the focus from, okay, you know, did, what did Kavanaugh do to, oh, let's look at him. Is he telling the truth? Let's dig into his life. Let's, let's, let's get all over him. And I think if you're his lawyer, you say, no, no, we declined to. We don't have any reason to do that. Do we as a people really believe that? I remember who I, I, remember who I made out with in high school sometimes. Do you? <laughs> Maybe sometimes. <laughs> as, your attorney, I you, as your attorney, I advise you not to talk about that on TV. Without so, going any further. Especially if but your wife is watching. Are we to, are we to believe that this, that, that this woman is... Just mistaking somebody who tried to uh, sexually assault her with someone else? That's a tough sell, right? That, that she's at this party and it's, it's, you know, John Doe. I don't, we don't even need the guy's name. John Doe, that it's his house. And somehow she thinks that it's Brett who is trying to sexually assault her. At, I mean, how, how, do we, how do we believe that? And just so I'm clear, has she ever made these allegations up until now? From what I understand, no. Okay. Well, so, so so she not publicly. She 
she allegedly told her therapist in 2012 that there had been this sexual assault. She may or may not have told the therapist who the guy was, but he was prominent and he was maybe even a judge. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, so she had said that okay. something had happened. And, and, and the reality is that, that where we have, why we are having also this uh, fight uh, about whether or not there should be an FBI investigation or whether the <laughs> hearing be, should be delayed is that apparently Senator Feinstein had this information at least six weeks ago in the form of a letter and did nothing about it. Didn't tell anybody, didn't ask the FBI to follow up on it. It had not become public at that point. And you know, now her lawyer has come on and said, well, we won't talk until there's an FBI investigation. Well, the FBI only does background checks at the request of the White House for this stuff. They're, they're not here to investigate facts. And you know, they're, they're just looking at background stuff and raise character issues for the White House that are then they don't have to even be turned over to the Senate. They're, you know, they're just for the White House, and the White House, by courtesy, hands those background checks over. And you know, she could have raised that if she wanted additional the, the the FBI to go out and do an additional background check. And as Senator Grassley raised in his letter, uh, I think either yesterday or today, was look, you know, she's the one who's now chosen to make this public. The whole point of the FBI is to do this in private and, and alert people to things. Why are we going to do this now? She's talking about it. She's named everybody in the whole thing, for God's sake. What does the FBI need to go do? So assuming that she turns up on Monday, how should she be questioned? <sighs> Hard. Well, she's going to be questioned poorly, I can tell you that, by looking <laughs> at the way Kamala Harris and Woo! Cory Booker and mm. everybody else, all these former prosecutors who didn't, don't know how to cross-examine a wet paper bag. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it was, it was awful. I, so I, I don't hold any faith that they're... Well. So how about bringing in a, a state sex crimes prosecutor to cross-examine Kavanaugh? And how about bringing in a criminal, how about bringing you in to cross-examine the, the woman? Yeah. Ms. Ford? I mean, I don't think that's what the point of these hearings are, frankly. Right. What's the point, what do you believe the point of the hearings are? I think the point of the hearings are to determine whether or not from a, and, and look, I mean, they can make a character and fitness evaluation uh, if they want on, on basic questions and, and the review, but from the standpoint of, they've, they've just been making this thing an outright ridiculous show, right? And I mean, why, it's like I said last week, if everybody is so involved in this stuff, why don't we give the same attention to when we have a hearing of a, of a district court judge or a fifth circuit judge or, or a DC, DC circuit, circuit judge? judge. Because yeah, those right. courts are the ones <laughs> that honestly decide and impact people's lives more than the Supreme Court. You know, they want to get on the, the major media networks and say, this is so important because he's a lifetime tenure judge on the most important cases. No, he's not, frankly. I hate to burst your bubble, but he's not because they only accept, I mean, they are so worried about Roe versus Wade being overturned, okay? Three out of the four of us sitting here, Roe versus Wade doesn't affect. It doesn't, okay? <laughs> Three out of the four. And, and, and frankly, it doesn't matter for the majority of the freaking country. Well, it, well it's a half the country. Purposes. Half the country. No, I mean, I'm serious. Other 50%. Than for political beliefs, religious beliefs, it's well, what has a more day to day effect. Okay, so, well, I, so well, there's a day to day effect. Can I at least respond yes, to this as, as the, no, the, the sole female? I, I want you to. <laughs> I understand what you're saying. And I honestly, in my day-to-day -day life as a lawyer, it, Roe versus Wade doesn't affect me either. Of course it doesn't. Yeah. But it, it, it's, it's, it's the freedom, it's the choice, it's, it's my rights. And the, the fact that I even have to have a case that says I have these rights kind of makes me mad. Well, we have Miranda. Well, which they've okay. been stripping away, which okay. I would argue thank is you. thank is you, man. Even... Thank you, man. I, I, appreciate <laughs> that. Good, appreciate good that. Explanation there. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for mansplaining. I'm just, my I'm reproductive not to I'm just throwing, I appreciate I'm just it. Trying to throw out a, a, another case yeah. out there. No, but the fact that I have to have a case that you know the, the men have decided to say, like, oh, okay, look, yes, you have these rights. I, I thank you. Let me just thanks, men. So I, I get what you're, you're welcome. saying. You're welcome. On behalf of all of us, <laughs> you're so welcome. welcome. Thank you. So I get it. I get where you're, but I, I, I do get where you're coming from. On a day to day, it doesn't affect me. I, I understand that's not what we're involved in, but it, it's important. And going back to this woman, and I'm going to say this, and it's probably going to upset some people, like hashtag me too, but it's suspect. It's suspect that you come out now after all these years 
at a time when it is the most prominent in his career. And like you're saying, not the most meaningful, really. This is not the most meaningful job he's taken. No. But it's just the most high profile. Yes. And now suddenly you come out with these allegations. And I am not in a position to say they're true or not true. I don't have all the facts, but it is, it's suspect. And I think there's a lot of men who have been facing these allegations at a time when it is the most poignant po point in this man's life. And suddenly, suddenly you do it. Well, so and it's, it's, It makes me question. Well, so what? So what? So this, this woman waited until the last minute to come out and say that I was sexually assaulted by this man. So what? If it's the eve of his confirmation. You know, the problem eh. is, and I, I, I can't sit here, I don't think any of us can say whether she's telling the truth. I mean, in fact, I, I, as Waylon points out, she probably is telling the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. but the fact that you wait so long and you wait till it is a moment like this it undermines your credibility. W but was it a, was it, did the Democrats weaponize the Me Too movement and plan it to, to come out this way? So maybe she came out, she came out to certain people, people knew about this, but it was held. Yeah. You know, we have a reality show president and everybody's getting into the spirit of the, the overproduced reality show, right? Yeah. Ooh, yeah. let's do a cutaway to, to uh, Kamala Harris and let's see her expression at that. And, and, you know, and she's got the big expression and she's asking the bad questions badly. And, and then we go back to Kavanaugh and boy, under those, that questioning, he sure looks like he's evasive. He sure, sure looks like he's a liar. And it's all just, yeah, it's all spin. It's all spin. Yeah. It's all right. It's, it's, it's persuasive, not because it's true, but because it's, it's giving people ammunition, right? Mm -hmm. It's giving the, the Republicans ammunition to say, this is what I believe and here's what supports it. And I can ignore everything else. And the Democrats, the same thing. This gives me ammunition to believe this thing. And it's just dividing us more well, and more, yeah. it's sorting us well, and, it's, and decides. It, it goes back to what you said earlier about, you know, we're not under the reasonable doubt standard. So anybody can make this allegation. As soon as you hear it, I think, I, I was in a, a voir dire a couple of weeks ago and a woman on there uh, worked with uh, sexual assault uh, survivors and she said, we are trained to believe them regardless. As soon as they walk in the door, we believe them, which I think is a great thing for her that is exactly how you should be. But as a society, as soon as a woman says something, there's almost been this like crazy flip, right? Before we don't believe anything, now we believe everything. Neither one is the correct response. As soon as you make an allegation, if you don't immediately believe them, you hate women. If you don't believe them, you're, you know, patriarchy, misogynist. And so, but we, we haven't really vetted this. We don't really know what the truth is. This was so long ago. Are we ever going to know the truth? Maybe not. But we can't just make these allegations and have that immediate belief. And, and how do you reconcile, um, all of you, uh, the, this, the Me Too movement when it comes to stuff like this with the epidemic and, quite frankly, bigger rash of female teachers going after underage students. Well, um, just hot. girls being girls. Hot. Hot. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's a... <laughs> I agree. I agree with I, Jimmy. I mean, that was I the agree. worst response from everybody. <laughs> <I> really? <laughs> the worst response. I mean, every day there seems, barstool sports, every day they seem to have a breakdown you know, the hotness factor of the latest teacher charged in a sexual assault scandal of one of their students every day. But see, they make a joke of it by analyzing the hotness of the, the perpetrator, uh, whereas if it's a man attacking a woman, you know, then then it becomes it's a double standard. Yeah, and I'm you sick know, of men it. being raped is always a joke, whether it's right. by women or in prison. Well, it's, in prison, you know, it's you know, yeah, oh ha ha ha. Why is that? Happen. That's interesting. Why yeah. is that? Is it really because we think men aren't harmed by it? No, that's not true of prison rape, at least. Um, is it because we don't care? Is it because this is a matriarchy and and you know we're living under the system that favors it, know, women it, over or, men? Or is it the fact that now we have just a plethora of men who have never committed rape who are fearful of being accused of rape who are just apologetic for all the Ooh. people who have committed rape? Ooh, well. Mark Cuban, ten million dollars got him out of his mess. Yeah. You heard of Mark Cuban? I know Mark big Cuban is. Big allegation, Mavericks organization, oh. all down with uh, harassment and such. He pays $10 million to, to, to support um, women and women groups and victims' rights. He apologizes and... 
Oh well, yeah, I mean, ten ten million to a billionaire. He just yeah. bought his way out of that. He just bought his way out of that. I don't know, Mark. Why don't you come on the show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. You. I'm sure. Well, he might have gotten his brother on the show before that. Yeah. Brian, I have seen Brian his brother, could yeah. come talk about addiction, but I don't think he's going to after that, my friend. Yeah, way to go, Julio. I nice, try, baby. I try. <laughs> Mark, where you? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know where this circus is going to go next, uh, frankly. It's a show. Yeah. It really is. Dude, does he deserve to be? I mean, look, uh, what about when Obama, uh, uh, what, what's going on? Martin, I mean, Mary right. I mean, look, who's to say who deserves a Supreme Court seat, right? I mean, unfortunately, we have this method of doing it where you go where the White House nominates you, and really it's the party that's in power that gets that choice and, you know, the confirmation hearing. So... Who's to say that any of the people that have gotten it ever before are, are meritoriously entitled to it? I mean, you look at it, and yeah. it's all been Harvard, Yale law grads. I mean, th and, and for the most part, white males. Yeah. Um, there hasn't been a single person, as far as I can tell, from a normal everyday school. I mean, it's not like South Texas College of Law, whatever they call it now, at Houston, <laughs> uh, where both Julio and I went. I mean, I'm... I don't even know. Did you go there, Katie? No, I went to U of H. I went okay. to the Better Law School. Yeah. Oh, oh so. damn. The one, the one that whoa, doesn't, whoa, the one that doesn't whoa, whoa. have an uh, identity crisis. The one that, no. the one the the one that won the lawsuit. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, I, I mean, it's not like those people are getting on the court. So we get, you end up with professors or people who have spent their entire life in government and not, other than Sonia Sotomayor, uh, I'm not sure that, I mean, what was it? Roberts had never even been pulled over for a traffic ticket. Had never been stopped by the cops for even a traffic uh, ticket. Which, Do not trust a person like that. No, right. never trust a person like that. You really never pulled over never. once. Uh, I mean, if you've never mm. been interrogated by the cops, are you really living life at this point? You're time? not. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. We got a call coming in. Let's take our first phone call for the evening and see who all is out there. Hello, thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Yeah, I had to call in. I of can't let it stand that, uh, Jimmy, you say that most people don't care about a woman's right to make decisions for her own reproductive body. Yeah, I think that's not only wrong, but I I think that there are a lot of people who oh, I think a may lot not of be able care. to. Yeah, a lot of people do, but I think not just people who could not just women care. There are a lot of men who don't think that the government should be able to tell anybody what that they could do with their body. Other thing that I, other point that I would make is that everything y'all are saying is more reason for why this should not be rushed. The the uncertainty for everything, and that's what most people on the Democrat side, their problem with this whole thing is, is how quickly it's being pushed through. Especially now in the face of this new allegation, there needs to be a chance for the facts to be investigated and a determination one way or another, or no way or another, to be made. All of what y'all are saying are reasons for why the Republican Party or whatever party is pushing this to be so, done so quickly without an investigation are reasons why an investigation should be conducted. And then, Jimmy, for you to say that the the tax are all of me, the, the, making Ro, the well, Democrats are making <laughs> Brett Kavanaugh's uh, nomination about Roe versus Wade, the entire reason why Trump nominated him, Trump ran on nominating judges who were going to overturn Roe versus Wade. They, I sign up for a lot of conservative email lists, and I've been getting a flood of those. We've got to support Brett Kavanaugh because of his, he's going to overturn Roe versus Wade. So I just, I, I don't think that that can, that can be gone without being checked. That all of our thing is correct. The problem is not the allegations being made. It's the speed at which there's no investigation. Well, what are you? So, uh, so hold on. So, so, <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, Diane Feinstein has this information and holds on to it for two months and sort of halfway leaks it. Um, right at a critical juncture when things could either go ahead or things could be delayed possibly until after the midterm election. And then somebody else leaks the woman's name a little bit after that. So she starts getting all of this attention. Seems stage managed. Mm -hmm. It seems like this I'm is... I'm not saying it's not a politicized... So, so it seems like it's, it's stage event. managed. Right. So it's stage managed just to get that delay. So do you give the toddler the cookie when the toddler gets caught reaching into the cookie jar and trying to steal the cookie? No. Who's catching the toddler? Another toddler? 
Ah, because that's, that's what we're dealing with here that, is, a bunch, that, is 100 well, toddlers. Well, right, right. So we've got to be the grown-ups, and we've got to look at it and say, you know, why? You know, if, if, how much time do we want to spend on this when, it was, when it's so obviously a political delay job? Do we want to give them the political delay? I don't know. Even with Honestly, the, but, if only, the, but if only the White House the could ask for the investigation that's already been done by the other person that y'all were talking about, the layout of the house, the lookalike and all that, that's one person who presumably doesn't have the resources that the FBI has. He was already able to put all that together. Why can't the FBI have this for 24 hours? But you're, you're confusing that, that this is not the FBI's job at this point. It becomes their job as soon as someone asks them to. No, it doesn't. You made that point. No, it doesn't. You said the, that, the that, White that, House. that these kind of things are investigated at the request of the president. So all the president has to do is ask them to investigate it. Or the background check before we ever get to this point. And, Either and one. Does, everything's but, I mean, well, well let's stop ourselves. We're asking the FBI to investigate a sexual assault. It's something they don't investigate, something right. that their they're, they're, they're people aren't trained in doing. The, the first step in a sexual assault allegation is you take it to the local police department. I don't think FBI, I don't think those people are, on a bigger level, I think there's the human trafficking that they may, they may take part in. But I think on that individual level, like, that's not what they do. I agree with Jimmy on that. That's I'm not, not saying that point. it's an everyday investigation for them, but are you saying that the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the United States of America doesn't have the resources or a personnel ability what personnel with the ability to investigate this allegation? No, I'm saying it's not their job at this point. This isn't a criminal investigation. But they're the. They're, but wh but what, they what does it matter? Checks. What does it matter? And they can investigate. They investigated the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill thing, and it took them three days to do so. Okay, you want to talk about that? And here's here's my other issue with that is Grassley's letter refers to that and and talks about everybody who's still on our freaking committee today who was around 30 years ago. I mean, that let, let's pull back for a second and talk about the fundamental problem that we still have people alive on this Senate Judiciary hearing that were around for Anita Hill. Uh, They're still doing the same damn thing. Mm. You know, you pay, everybody up wants, or out, guys. Right. Up or out. Yeah. She, I mean, so, she, she didn't so delay. This is a politicized process. They knew it was going to be a politicized process before they started the entire thing. Well, they did. And now they're surprised that there's politics being injected into it. This, who's, this who's is what I'm saying. The problem well, with who's the politics surprised? is what Mark said, and that they want to get this done before the midterm election because they're afraid that their commander in chief has run his mouth so much on Twitter that they're going to tank, that he's tanked the election. And they're not going to be able to get a nomination through after the election. But they're, that's, they're, that's what happens with politics. Ultimately, though, there's no there's no question that that he's not going to have the votes to qualify him, right? I mean, he's 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 in. It's just a, a last smear. Well, campaign. I think the theory is that maybe after or January. Wait a minute, how do they hold it till January? Right, that maybe after the election, the moral weight of the Senate will be changing, and so they won't. No, I think that's nonsense. I think that we have the same Senate in December as we have now. Does the individual who has been accused of sexual assault, and so what if she has waited so long to say something, and, and probably been manipulated in some regard by the Democrat Party mm -hmm. as far as withholding when this, this information comes out. And the fact that there may be some credible evidence that he may be a liar in regards to other issues. Mm -hmm. Does, should that person be the Supreme, uh, uh, on the bench of the Supreme Court of the United States of America? Well, I mean, well, if you're going to try and find the perfect person, you're never going to find it. Well, I submitted my application six months ago. <laughs> I haven't heard back anything. Well, I think They've I'm been just in, trying to find the women you made out with in high school. Sins. Sins. I'm also a little confused, though. Isn't there a presumption of innocence in this at all? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, you're making, well, I get, because it's a, con well, that goes back to the very key of what we're talking about. This Definitely. is a confirmation hearing where what you're making is criminal allegations. If these were just criminal allegations with not this happening, there is a presumption of innocence. And we should all still be thinking of him as innocent at this point. But yet he's not being afforded that at all in this. He is basically, the allegation's been made, he's guilty. What about well, from what, the left? What I'm about, not gonna say what side, but I'm just saying, <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's, weird, that's what you know, it's I mean, happening. What about when he around. didn't shake the hand of the father who, uh, of, 
of a of of a of a child who was killed in one of them shootings. That was rude, disrespectful, and based on that book, that was a terrible move. I think you know when the guy comes up and is like, "Hey," and he looks at it, looks at the guy, and turns around and walks away. I don't want that guy sitting at the highest bench of the land. Well, okay, JV. I mean, okay. <laughs> it's just me. Okay. That's fair. You know, I, I don't know what happened there. I, I watch as little video online as yeah. I can. I saw tweets that said, oh, here's the video showing what really happened, which is that security came at about that moment and, and separated yeah. them for some reason. Um, I don't know. And, and, you know, the media and the government and the corporations, they're all trying to direct our attention to what helps them, which is not necessarily what's factual, right? It's not, they're not trying to convince us with evidence of what the truth is. They're, they're directing our attention. Oh, pay attention to this. Because one of the principles of, of Cialdini is that what we pay attention to is what's important to us. The privileged moments. Those privileged moments. Right. That, that we can, we get, yeah, you know, I mean, we get, they, they, they latch on to us. Well, I and, think that's so interesting because you talk about that and, and what, what's important to us is, is what we focus on. And that's what's Well, happening. and the other way around that, that, okay. Well, right. In both senses. In both right? senses. Right. That, that and, we focus on what's important and what we focus on becomes important. It's and, a loop. And then, and, it's and a loop, JV. And that's, that's really what politics has become with each side doing just that. Sure. You know, I mean, sure. they, they extract little things out of whatever anybody says, whatever is important to them, and that's what they focus on, and that's what becomes the. And you always hear about this. Well, they're playing to their base. They're playing, and that's what they're doing. They're they're picking out what's important to them, and that's what they're putting out there, and they're playing to their base. And my my point is, why the hell are they playing to them? They've got them. Right. It's not like it's, it's not like the Democratic base is going to go vote yeah. for the Republicans and the Republican well, base is going to go vote for the Democrats. So is Kavanaugh, if Kavanaugh's applying for a job, why wouldn't they? Well, I guess the Republicans have extended and say, hey, come, uh, come testify. Uh, we're not going to have this FBI investigation before that and come and we'll see. And, and t I guess Monday, right? Is it, was a deadline. Come and talk to us by Monday. But should she have to go and do that? Or is an FBI investigation more appropriate? I pose that to you. I, I technically don't agree. I mean, I, I, without my opinion, I'm posing it to the panel. But what, what, what are they going to do? I, mean, I agree. It's just a big fat smear campaign. I it think. goes back to Mark's question. I mean, if the FBI comes knocking at the other guy's door and you're his lawyer, <laughs> you're going to say, uh, no, no, thank you. <laughs> Can um, you imagine being the guy that looks like Kavanaugh? You're just here to do a. Oh you're just, man! You're just here to do a furtherance of a background check. Oh man! Sorry, yeah. we're not gonna talk to you. Yeah. But. Okay. Well, just as any other candidate who's applying for a job, is the is this the, where does Kev, where if Kavanaugh is appointed, where does he seat amongst the justices, and? Uh, I think he becomes a Roberts type. Yeah. I really do. You know, and all the all the liberals were so concerned about Roberts. And on a lot of cases, he's become their best friend. He's a swing vote. A right. lot of times, he's the swing vote. He's the new swing vote. Yeah. And I think that's where Kavanaugh ends up, frankly, if he guts on this bench. You know, I mean, the, the reality is everybody has all these, you know, chicken little moments each time one of these nominees gets on. Uh, the, the Republicans had it about Merrick Garland that, oh, he's going to take everybody's guns, you know, and, and your Second Amendment rights are, are going away if Merrick Garland gets on the bench. Just look at this opinion. And, you know, now the left is saying the similar things about Kavanaugh on the issues that are important to them. And the reality is when these guys get on the bench, they call it right down the middle. You see the part. You see the tweet by... Uh, they, they, they screw us on Fourth Amendment and search <laughs> issues and, you know, sentencing issues and everything else. And they just say, yeah, we're not going to take that case. We, you know, that, that's good law. So, I mean, you know, and, and, and I, I kind of want to switch gears a little bit because, you know, and, and not take the whole thing on Kavanaugh because i got a lot I want to get to. But, I mean, it's important because, again, I go back to the fact that Yes, I mean, I, I, I understand the critical importance of a case like Roe v. Wade. And I, and I don't mean to sound, you know, cynical and everything else about it, but the reality is cases like Miranda and what's come after them and the cases that occur at the Fifth Circuit, at the D.C. Circuit, at the Fourth Circuit, at the Ninth Circuit, that never make it to the Supreme Court, that the Supreme Court refuses cert. So basically those decisions of those judges become the law of the land. 
and they only take those cases if the circuits disagree. Mm -hmm. And so those judges are the ones that are making the majority of the law that affects the majority of the people. Ooh, I don't know. I would vote for those nine Court of Criminal Appeals judges in, uh, in Austin for doing yep. that. I think that the Court of Criminal Appeals, I think Texas trial courts have more effect over more people more directly uh, than, mm. than federal appellate courts. Uh, uh, now, you know, there are arguments, okay, well, you know, there's this principle that yeah. the, ninth, uh, the, the Fifth Circuit adopts and it covers all of these states, but the number of prosecutions in those states in federal court is tiny compared to the, the number of state prosecutions in the same area. Yeah. No, so, I, I, I fully so, agree with you. you I mean, know, people, in people, terms of volume, for sure, the state and, courts. And, you know, we see this from left and right. Every, oh, everybody has strong feelings about the federal government. The federal government's very important. Mm. Uh, the federal government has less influence over our lives than state <coughs> and local governments do. So it's funny, and I don't have the case site with me, and I wish I did, but it just made me think of this. So there was this, a, a Fifth Circuit opinion that came out this week um, that was, it was a civil case, but it was, it had to do with a lawsuit regarding a, an individual who was wrongly convicted, there was some Brady information that was not turned over, exculpatory mm. evidence not turned over, and there was a civil lawsuit as a result of it, and it went all the way up to the Fifth Circuit. And um, Judge Costa wrote a stinging, <coughs> stinging uh, dissent in the case, which, you know, basically said, you know, if, if fortunately for this guy, right, he was in state court and not in federal court because there in state court we we have determined and and the federal courts ironically have upheld on the state court stuff that you are entitled to Brady information <coughs> prior to a plea. The same is not true in federal criminal law. <coughs> that that federal prosecutors mm. do not actually have to hand over anything, much less Brady, before you take a plea. And if you took a plea and it turns out there was exculpatory evidence, tough luck. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was an interesting, I mean, I, I, I'll try and find it and send it to you guys, but it was a, it was a very, it was a civil opinion that said that. I mean, I, and, and so to, to that, I think that helps make your point, Mark, that, you know, the, the state courts can really affect and, and affect a lot more people on a daily basis in terms of substantive criminal rights. And so, I think both I think both of you are right in saying that and this is why I agree that you know Roe versus Wade I got your 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 point on that because I honestly I the, the rhetoric on Roe versus Wade is is sexy to talk about, right? Like oh my god, he's going to be it's not going to be overturned. I don't care who takes the bench. It's not going to be overturned. I I'm I sorry guess. as as an as an attorney, as a female, as somebody who's smart who looks at it, it's not there's just no way. Are you smart? The, well, you're smart. You're the law guy. No, I you're the law guy. Yourself. But it's it's not going to be overturned. Whoever well, is the president, whoever takes a Supreme Court seat, it's not going to be overturned. I'm sorry. The the outrage by the world and, would be so massive that it's just not going to happen. It's not going to affect us. It, it, but it's it's great rhetoric to talk about. It's sexy to talk just, about. Just like the repealing the Second Amendment. Yeah, oh. it, it's, it's the same thing. But you're both right. Uh, you know, you were talking federally. You're talking state, and those are the cases that affect you day to day. And Luke Looping back to the state being more influential, suppose Roe versus Wade goes away. What happens to the right to abortion in Texas? Maybe eventually the legislature passes yeah. a law and it's outlawed. What happens to the right to abortion in Connecticut? Ugh. Connecticut, Maine, New York, New Jersey, California, Oregon, Washington. I mean, we're going to <laughs> thought that I have. We're going to go through all the states, and they're going to say, you know, just like they did on the weed, just yes. on marijuana. They're going to say, all right. I don't care what you say, we're going to do this. Well, right. And, and it, yeah, I mean, the, the principle And it's even bigger is, of an impact, yeah, right? Because yeah. it, it, it's not weed, it's my organs, right? You know, it's, yeah. it's a bigger thing. And that's why just it, it, being caught up in that whole thing is, is it, it's, it's a great political move. Look over here, look over here, see what I'm doing over here. Just watch this, right? And not really see what I'm doing. And that's what they're doing. Don't be confused by that. And, and right, and what are they really doing? Well, that's the question. Because <laughs> I'm too busy looking over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I, 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 I want to bring this to a, to an interesting um, study uh, and document that came out last month from the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, uh, called the Trial Penalty. Their Trial Penalty Report, and its subtitle is "The Sixth Amendment Right to Trial on the Verge of Extinction." 
and how to save it. And, uh, you know, we, we saw Paul Manafort enter a plea last week after going to trial, uh, being acquitted of some, or mistried on some counts, convicted on others, facing a second trial. He, he worked out a deal with the special counsel. A lot, of, a, a lot of people are, you know, looking at the deal and talking about how the special counsel has written it in a way that probably prevents a pardon or allows them, even if he gets a pardon, to, you know, still go Take after. away all of his toys exactly. and prosecute him again. Right. Um, and, you know, they're not focusing on the fact that, that this is what happens in so many cases, um, that people plead guilty. And, uh, it, it, you know, the stats, this, this document in and of itself, and, and for those who want to read it, it's on NACDL's website. They've put a lot of effort into it. I know they've been looking at cases over a long period of time. Uh, it's about 84 pages. Um, some, some of the font is bigger than others, so it won't take you an excessively long so time here, to read. Go ahead and read it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm in trial. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. trial. I just yeah. got the, the, the supplement. The I just got the supplement <laughs> off the report. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's, it's in there somewhere. Hey, in there somewhere. Hey. Um, Here's our witnesses, <laughs> right? We may not call all of them. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, we may not call the ones that are most relevant to your defense. Oh. Um, but, you know, and I think the statistics bear out both on the federal and the state side that the majority over, you know, well in excess of 90%. And in the federal system, it's over 97% of cases end up in a guilty plea. No. And this is the bone that I have to pick with this and with the Cato Institute's crap research on, on the vanishing jury trial. If you look at this, the first five pages, you never see the word federal mentioned. But it's all about federal court. Correct. As though federal court is especially important. Federal court is not especially important. In 2017, there were 76,000 criminal cases filed in federal court. There were 208,000 felonies filed in Texas the year before that. 208,000? 208,000, so two Jeez. and a half times as many. So in Texas, I mean, I, I pulled the numbers today because this is something that I'm passionate about. There may very well be a problem. I'm not saying there's not a problem with the jury trial. We always should try more trials. But something like 20 to 25% of cases result in, in, in Texas, result in dismissal or acquittal. Of the people who don't waive a jury trial, well, 23% of people don't waive a jury trial. That's the, that's the heart of the number here, yeah. right? Now, not waiving a jury trial, some of them get their cases dismissed, a whole lot of them do. Every case that's dismissed is somebody who refused to waive a jury trial, right? Right. Yeah. Because if they'd waived a jury trial, the case would never have been dismissed. <laughs> right. Um, 1,800 people convicted, 534 acquitted, 45,000 dismissed. You've got to look at those dismissed because that's a lawyer and a client who are making the decision, do we plead guilty or do we, or do we hold fast? They hold fast and the case goes away. Well, so, and, and, but don't you think there's a difference because, I mean, on the state side, they have, look, let's be honest, they have terrible intake for the most part. And so pretty much anything comes in and it's evaluated later. On the federal side, they have a much more stringent evaluation on the front end, and so there's not nearly as many dismissals in federal court uh, as there are sure, percentage-wise. Sure. And, and also the problems in this, in this paper are, are absolutely true of federal mm -hmm. court. What I take issue with is people saying, oh, this is the problem that we need to deal with when there are probably bigger problems in state court. For example, deferred adjudication probation. People yeah. take deferred adjudication probation all over the place. One-fourth of felony cases ended in deferred adjudication probation. Avoid the felony. Avoid the conviction. And avoid the conviction, except that in that same year, about half of the people who were on probation got their probation revoked. There were about 30,000 <coughs> motions to revoke and about 60,000 people put on probation. So if you, if you get put on probation and there's a 50% chance that you're going to be revoked, that's not avoiding the felony. Is that because of a shortcoming in the criminal justice system? And what would they be? Well, and the problem on deferred too is you're still open to the full range of punishment upon returning. <laughs> I'm going to blame I'm going to blame the criminal defense bar for that one. I think that there are a lot of lawyers in the criminal defense bar who see deferred as avoiding the felony. But when, the, the penalty for exercising their constitutional rights is simply just too high of a risk, according to this study. Well, and and in federal court, I think that's absolutely true. In state court, I don't think that's true. I think a lot of you know half of the people who took probation would probably have been better off going to trial. I, I agree with you because we're getting prosecutors down there who are setting trials 
without even looking or reviewing at the evidence, both at the misdemeanor level and at the felony level. They are under, uh, they're overworked, understaffed, and what's happening is are these judges uh, pushing their dockets, and we end up at a pretrial, trial or plea setting, and they set it for the, the mere purpose of not looking bad to their superiors. So they'll set it, they'll set the thing, and they'll say, oh, uh, this case looks good. Yeah, no, we're fine, Judge. We'll offer two-year deferred right now. And they haven't done, they haven't looked at the video. They haven't done their rip calls. They haven't done anything. So the client is faced with going to these trials without even the, the other side uh, doing their job. Yes, yes. It's a problem. Well, yeah. And, and the defense, what's the defense doing about it? Well, because in, in, in any particular case, what's the defense doing? Well, uh, if you got a good, well, uh, some of us are trying. Well, some of us right. trying well, cases. I think that I think your your first words out of your mouth. If, if you have a good defense attorney, they're trying it. Yeah. And that shouldn't be. You know, but I, I felt like what you're saying, because you're like, if you have a good one, well, if you have a defense attorney, they should be trying it. Right. If this per, if the prosecutor hasn't even looked at the case. You should be going that route, but so many aren't doing that. They just take the deferred because it is the easy way out. Mm -hmm. And I'm not faulting anybody. I, we've all been there. But I get your point. It's it one of the big problems that we have is in the state of Texas. If you've been convicted of a felony before, let's say 15, 20 years ago, you got some PCS uh, back in you know 99, okay. And now suddenly you're charged with aggravated assault, deadly weapon. Mm -hmm. On some bogus, he pulled a weapon, he didn't pull a weapon, it's a self-defense, it's not a self-defense. And suddenly, you're, you're not probation eligible anymore. And you're looking at five to life. Yeah. Easy. Well, here, yeah. Here's my biggest problem. I mean, and, and, and setting the, the trial penalties aside, because um, for, for just a moment, because I mean like, you know, some cases there really is no trial penalty. I mean, th th those sure. cases do sure. still exist. Yes, and, absolutely. And the problem is, there are too many lawyers who are scared to try cases, okay? And they complain, they say, well, you know, I just can't get the trial experience. And this is both civil and criminal. They sit there and they say, you know, we, we just can't get jury trials anymore. We just can't get any experience. And you sit there and you listen to them because you can hear them talking to their clients in the hallway uh, around our place. Um, and, <laughs> you know, and it's the same thing on the civil side. Here, here's what I see. Lawyers you can persuade your client to take that deal just by your actions. You know, your, your body language, the way you carry yourself, the way you talk. I mean, if you sit there and say something, well, you know, you go to trial and uh, this could just not be, this could not be really good for you. That does not ex inspire confidence in a client to go to trial. They think you're gonna end up being like the public defender and my cousin Vinny. And you know, stammering your words and not being yeah. able to make an opening <laughs> statement. Everything. You know, I mean. Was that so, rude? I didn't mean to be. Rude. I'm sorry. So we. <laughs> wow. It's terrible. What's next? <laughs> can we edit that out? Right. So I mean, you, the lawyer, can have a yeah. huge impact on persuading mm -hmm. or persuading their client whether or not to even go to trial in the first place. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the sad thing is so many of these theories, especially on the federal side, there are so many of these cases that the government brings in. It's becoming more and more, I mean, you, you look at some of these cases, the state has sometimes a wild interpretation of what amounts to a particular crime. We, the, there's a lot of things, you know, the, the, you keep hearing the over-criminalization of things. And, and more and more you're seeing just some wild interpretations of statutes, especially in the white collar world, uh, about what constitutes a crime and, and where there's intent to do something. And the problem is none of these lawyers are challenging them on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, oftentimes the defendant, I, I, I'm seeing here, you know, most judges happy for their own reasons to avoid time consuming trial will barely question the defendant beyond the bare bones of his assertion of guilt, relying instead on the prosecutor's statement of what the underlying facts are. I see that every day. I, 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 I had stopped seeing it when defendants were being released on unsecured bonds over, SOB bonds, sheriff bonds, over and over and over. I have started to see it again, where clients are pleading guilty to get out of jail and then questioned by the, by the judge 
And even when the individual, I've seen it, is, well, you know, I wasn't really doing anything. I was just in the car. And there's a, there's, there's a moment where everybody looks at each other and says, uh oh, oh, is he going to take the, it's, what's going to happen? Is the, is the, there, there's obviously a question as to his guilt. Is the judge going to take the plea? And at that point, you see the judge back off and say, well, it is what it is. And right. how do you, uh, yeah, yeah, how is it? But we see this. <laughs> but, or the other thing I see is that the judge gets mad at them mm -hmm. because now they've interrupted a plea. Mm -hmm. And so then they're like, well, you'll just you take them back there and you talk to him. We'll bring him back to you tomorrow as if it's like a threat. They don't want to actually know the truth of what's being said. They're just mad that now they still have a, a case on their docket because they know that they can legitimately not take it. And so they get pissed. So that's yeah. what I see judges do. So that's judges forgetting who the system is about. And it's lawyers forgetting who the system is about. And it's mm -hmm. prosecutors forgetting who the system is about, right? Because all of you, they're all thinking, oh, this is about me. This is disrupting my day, my schedule, whatever. It's not, it's not about you. It's not. It's about the client. Mm -hmm. Always is, always has been. That's the only reason we exist. So. Well, and y'all were talking about deferreds earlier and spending most of my defense attorney career so far on DWIs where deferreds are not an option. It's a probation, which is something you can get after trial. Right. So there's no reason not to go to trial, which is why DWI attorneys said everything for trial because prove it. I have nothing to lose. And, you know, judges get mad at us, prosecutors get mad at DWI attorneys for doing that. But I, I think it's a really great way to do it. Like, put up your cards. Show us your cards. Right. So, so those numbers where, where, you know, there are 45,000 dismissals. Suppose that one more case gets set for trial. What's it going to be? Is it going to be a trial or is it going to be a dismissal? Something has to give. The courts don't want to try any mm -hmm. more cases. If we, if we demand jury trials on more cases, it's not going to result in more people having jury trials, it's gonna result in the same number of people having jury trials and more cases being dismissed. You know, we yeah. talked to, we recently talked, I mean, just uh, right before this, we went to Judge Velasquez's uh, campaign fundraiser party, which was off the chain. And uh, we spoke to a very seasoned, uh, uh, who's now a defense attorney, former uh, chief felony prosecutor. And he was saying some of the, along the same things is, Save your, uh, a chief felony prosecutor or a big case. You're going to try 15 to 16 or 18 cases a year. Save those for the 18 m most uh, cases that need to be tried. A felony chief is going to try 18 cases a year? Uh, no, I think well, he the was. the court itself. Yeah, the court. The court. Is, yeah, the okay. court's going to try 12 to 15 cases. And his point was save those for the worst of the worst. Right. Those are bad guys that you really need off the street. Save those for that. Sorry, I'll let you continue. Right, right. Yeah. Well, and, and the rest of them, let them go. Cut a deal. Or set up, well, because ultimately, he, ultimately the, the, the idea behind it was that the prosecution is going to have to dismiss these things. And so set them, set them for trial. Go for it, because it was on the heels of his discussion of uh, that the prosecution wasn't prepared. They weren't doing what they're supposed to do. They set him for, he set them for trial. They get dismissed, and every, it's a big waste of time for everybody. But it's a few and far between, where the 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 lawyer, the defense attorney says no. Uh, so what if you're not probation eligible? He was 25 to life on like five cases, and he said, you know what? Sorry, state of Texas, we're going on them. We're gonna go. And ended up the guy walked him out of he walked the guy out of jail, and you know they had dinner the next night and. What I think is, whatever, you know, I'm making that part of woman. Right, yeah. well, well, or not, I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm, I'm saying, but it's. I think his bigger point was to be, for prosecutors to be more reasonable in their plea bargaining, to understand that you're not going to get the max on everybody, you're not going to get what you want on everybody. Cut some deals, concentrate on the bad of the bad, and then if you really do have to cut one loose that you're not so happy about, he was like, Put somebody on them. If you know it's you know a crack dealer who may have raped somebody, but you really don't have that rape, cut it loose. Tell HPD they'll put somebody on them. You're going to get a hand to hand on the crack, and you're going to be done, right? Like there's other ways to do it if you put a little alternative thinking involved. Yeah, and you know the biggest and that, the biggest difference and problem from the federal side is that most federal cases are built through cooperation, aka mm -hmm. snitch testimony. And, and so what happens is all you get a multi-defendant indictment where you've got all these people 
And the government, because the prosecutors have so much power, they have basically from the start figured out where to slot these people, mm -hmm. you know? And so um, they have so much power in terms of offering people deals. Mm -hmm. And the problem is sometimes they cut the deal with the person who had the most information. That person gets the lowest sentence. Yeah. They're the most culpable. <laughs> yeah. And the person who's least culpable can't give any information, mm -hmm. and they get tagged with one of the highest sentences mm -hmm. because they couldn't cooperate on anybody. we got a quick phone call we want to get in here before we have to get off the air. So, hello. Thank you for calling Reasonable Doubt. Hey, I just wanted to say that you guys are doing a great service. I for appreciate the community, it. just by appreciating the complexity of the situation you work in. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. Awesome. The panel last week and the panel this week has been phenomenal, and you guys rock, and thank you for getting the message out that this system needs to be looked at. It's because of me. Yes, thank yes. you very much. This is why we are here. <laughs> this is why we have the Mark Bennett and the Kate Farrell in it's the Mark. Yeah. Appreciate, in the seat. Appreciate your call. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that, that's the biggest problem I see on the federal side is you've got guys, and I mean, it, it does happen sometime on the state side. They don't have nearly as many cases that are built on cooperation, but it, it, it does happen. I mean, there, there was a, one of the largest cases, uh, the Stanford case, where Alan Stanford got 105 years in prison. His CFO, who clearly knew everything about the company, cut a deal and ended up getting five years in prison. Hmm. And he was just as culpable as Alan Stanford, who went to trial. And so you've got a difference of 105 years between the guy who pled and went to trial. But then the next guy down the line, uh, who was kind of a, a head accountant, if you will, didn't know near as much as the CFO, couldn't, couldn't share anything. I mean, you could argue that he should have known under the willful blindness test that we so luckily have in, in federal court. But because he didn't really know, he didn't have any information to give. He goes to trial and ends up at 70 years old with a 45-year sentence. Where's the justice in that? You know? Where's the justice? That's really interesting. I've never, because I don't do federal work, and I, I just hear about, you know, the cooperation and how that all works, and I never really thought about it from that end. The fact that the person who probably doesn't know anything, so they have nothing to share, is going to get it the worst. Well, yeah, there's the yeah, only, there, yeah. there it is. Well, this, I didn't this have is what I'm chance, talking about. I didn't so have a chance to read it. About. Nobody gave it to me. What, so. what, what do you say, Mark? I mean, that's we that's we what it says. We're, no, we're I, that's, 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 that's interesting. Court, that's interesting. Court. Yeah. Um, I'd love to have you guys back to talk about this some more, but unfortunately, I got a I got the cue that we're supposed to wrap it up here. Hmm. Well, you know. Thank you. Appreciate you coming on. Uh, it's always good to have you on. I know we usually have you talking about First Amendment issues, so it was nice to kind of divert from that a little bit. I like to think about other things sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we like you to do that. And Kate, you did a wonderful job in the guest seat this week. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be back. Yes. Hopefully you'll have me back again. Of course we will. Yeah. JV, I'm not taking over your seat. Next week, <laughs> right here. <laughs> right. So I, I, I'm unclear. Are we actually starting candidate shows next week? I think so. Okay. I think so. so. Should we give the viewers something to look forward to next week? Or, I, or are we keeping it a secret for right now because we don't have... I want to see Franklin Bynum and Dan Simons on this show. Together? Together. Hmm. Yes, please. Can we, can we make it happen? That's what I want to say. We'll see. I think, I think the whole table needs to reach out to both candidates and let them know that this is a Ooh. fair, impartial show and we just want to see them talk about their issues. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm down. On October 4th. On <laughs> October 4th. Our producer is saying on October 4th. October 4th. That is officially all the time we have for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. For, so for my co-host, Julio Vela, and for my guests, Kate Farrell and the law god, Mark Bennett. <laughs> Good night, everybody. We'll see you next week on another edition of Reasonable Doubt. <laughs> so does that literally what this thing says? It's about